Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Stephen Miller, from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, Stephen did his undergraduate work at Yale, and he did his PhD in mathematics from Princeton. Uh, one very unique thing about him is that, uh, as you'll see a little bit of today, is he has a really diverse research portfolio, and in a way that um, even at Williams, uh, some of the unusual first scientists he published in geoscience, computer science, economics, uh, pure mathematics, and, and so he really has a impressive breadth uh, that we're quite jealous of. And uh, here at Williams, in addition to, to teaching, uh, we actually receive tenure at the same time. Yes. So I think you took a little bit of a shortcut from us, but uh, <laughs> you're the- I also did a six-year postdoc, and so- Okay, well, you know, we'll, 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 we, we, uh, we, we both came from around about the same time, yeah. which is nice. Um, but Steve's the, direct, the director of the Williams College uh, Small MAL uh, abbreviation uh, research program in the summer, which brings a lot of students to campus from all over. And he's the uh, faculty president of uh, our Yale campus expert. So uh, today we're going to hear about why the IRS cares about the remodel data function and number theory and why we should too. So let's give him a big round. Yeah. So thank you. It's nice to finally make one of these events. I've never been able to make them before because of my you know, children and the daycare situation. I have finally found a solution to have a sick child which forces me to pull them out of the daycare and bring them with me. So I would like to thank my son Cameron in advance for being such a good sport today and for asking some really good questions later. All right, so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about an email I got. I was a very young postdoc at the time in my many, many years of postdocdom. It began, greetings, my name is David Kelly. I'm a senior criminal investigator at the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> and that was about all I could read for five minutes. And then eventually, I gathered enough strength to read the rest of the email, which was, I just read with interest your recent paper in Acta Arithmetica on, and I was such a newly minted PhD that you know, the idea that somebody would actually care about listening and reading you know, the work I was doing was fascinating. And so we ended up having a really nice conversation. I've given lots of interesting talks to IRS agents. It's a strange experience going into some of their buildings. And what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the intersections between my world, uh, which is oftentimes pure mathematics, and the very applied. And so my goal today is to explain to you what is Benford's law, where does it occur, why does it occur, why do we care about its occurrence, and what can we use this for? Okay, um, for those of you who fall asleep, I am recording this talk, and if everything works with the technology, it will be available on YouTube later today. Okay, so the motivating question is, for a nice uh, set of data, let's say the Fibonacci numbers, the first digit of street addresses of people in this room, we can ask how likely are we to get certain digits? How likely are we to get a one, a two, a three, a four, et cetera? If you're not thinking that deeply about this question, what might you guess as the probability of observing a first digit of one? So somebody please don't think too deeply and just answer. Uh, 0 0.15. 0 0.15. <laughs> Thank you for satisfying the requirement. <laughs> so around 10%. So most people would say maybe around 10%, maybe all numbers are equally likely, but a natural scientist would say it's not going to be purely nice like one tenth. We should have some experimental error, maybe around 15%. We might correct this and realize if we're looking at the leading digit, it's not going to be a zero unless we're talking about the number of days in the past two weeks when both of my kids have been able to go to school because it's been open and they've been healthy. You know, <laughs> situations like that, you might get a zero, but for a lot of the stuff we're recording, they will have a non-zero value. And you know, a thought experiment might give you a distribution like this, correct to one ninth or 11%. In a lot of systems in nature, and in pure mathematics, we actually see something very different. We see a preponderance of first digits. And the answer is Benford's law, I will quantify this in great detail later because this is what we do in a pure math department, but about 30% of the time in many different systems, you will see a leading digit of one. And I wanna to try to explain to you why this is so exciting and what we can do with this. All right, so for me, Fibonacci numbers, I mean, what could be better than looking at Fibonacci numbers? Well, most people probably are not as excited about the Fibonacci numbers as I am, so we have a few other possibilities. Our most common iPhone passcodes. Twitter uses by the number of followers and distance of stars from Earth. With only four slides, I was trying to hit a wide range of, hopefully, uh, interests of people in the audience. This digit bias occurs in very different phenomena, and you see this prevalence of first digits and these mostly decreasing probabilities as you go further down in the digit distribution. 
right, so in summary, what are we gonna do today? I'm gonna explain Ben Fitt's law. I will discuss some of the examples and applications. I will sketch proofs because this is not a math seminar. I will try to remember that it's sketching proofs. And then I will describe open problems if time permits. If not, there are details on the slides and my students will be working on things related to this over the summer. All right. Just uh, one caveat before we go into the details for those of you about applications. A math test indicating fraud is not proof of fraud. So I am probably the first person in the history of Williams College to be excited about being audited. I was very excited when I was told last year that all the math and physics grants were gonna be investigated and I was really looking forward to meeting with the auditor to find out how were they looking for, dis well, okay. not for that, not for those reasons, but I was just curious as to how they were looking for things. And you know, one of the reasons I was you know, so comfortable is I like Williams' policy. I never get reimbursed until I hand in all of my documented paperwork, all itemized properly. I wasn't that worried. But I was curious as to what tests do they use. And it turns out this Benford's law is used by the IRS, and I'll talk more about that later, to detect tax fraud. I have emailed Scott Adams, and he's given me permission to use this strip. Uh, your travel expenses are rejected because all of your meal costs are round numbers. You're a liar or worse. I decide what to order based on what totals to a round number after 15% tip, that's worse. <laughs> so you, know, you do have to be careful just because you have a test that indicates or suggests fraud is happening, there could be alternative explanations. All right, so here is a small list of different situations where Benford's Law applies. A lot of times in recurrence relations, and I'll go through some of the details there. One of the reasons this is so important is recurrence relations or uh, Dif difference equations, these are discrete versions of differential equations. These describe transitions in states with a discrete time step. And as difference in differential equations describe so many natural phenomena, this is one reason why Benford's Law is so prevalent. Uh, lots of just other different choices. Um, I think it was mentioned that I did some work in geophysics, so that would be in the hydrology section over there. Financial data, turns out a lot of financial data sets have this bias. And I'll talk about why the bias is there, and you can begin to see why this might be so important to organizations like the IRS. All right, so in terms of applications, three of the biggest are analyzing round-off errors, determining the optimal way to store numbers. Uh, for those of you in computer science, there's a specific book you should be thinking of right now, volume two, talks a little bit about some of these issues. And then the last is detecting tax and image fraud. And so when I was growing up in Boston, uh, one of my favorite small mini scandals is one of the uh, news agencies was very upset about a broadcast about a Red Sox game the night before. And the reason they were upset is their network actually showed the game, and when another network broadcast the highlights of the game you know, on their show, they removed the logo of the company that was broadcasting the game live, and they doctored the image. So one of the big applications of Benefits Law is detecting when has data been modified. The data could be an image, the data could be returns of a company, could be individual tax returns. So that's one application. The other time is it may not be fraud. It may just be the system is not reporting values properly. So this could be data integrity. There may be nothing malevolent going on, but you may have values being recorded improperly. And Benefits Law becomes a very nice way to check this. All right, so I thought I would begin with a little bit of general theory. So Finally, here is an accurate statement of Benford's Law. If you want, for the most part, instead of thinking about digit B, you know, digits base B, you can think about digits base 10. And so what is the probability, if we have a data set, that we have a first digit of one, of two, of three? Well, the probability of a digit of D base B as the leading digit of my number is approximately the log of D plus one over D. So base 10, if you plug in these numbers, you'll get about 30% of the time the leading digits are one. As you increase D, the probabilities get smaller. So looking at things base 10, you start with a high of around 30%. If it satisfies Benford's law, we'll have a first digit of one, down to about 4.6% having a first digit of nine. All right, so just some background notation. So modulo, I say A equals B mod C, means A minus B is an integer times C. So Cameron? Can I ask you to do a math question for me? If it's 10 o'clock now, what time is it in four hours? Thank you. So Cameron is seven years old, and he's just told me that 10 plus four is two. Is that what you just told me, Cam? <laughs> so the reason he's right is we're working on a clock. And once we go past 12, we reset and go back to zero and then start counting again. So we go 10 to 11, 11 to 12, and then 12 to one, one to two. 
So we say two numbers are the same mod c if their difference is a multiple of c. So first, the most important thing to look at later will be looking at things mod 1. And two numbers will be the same mod 1 if they have the same fractional part, if they differ by an integer. Uh, the next thing is scientific notation, and just saying it in a fancy way. So if you give me any positive number, x, I can write it as a number between 1 and 10, the significant, times 10 to some power. If k is positive, I've got a bunch of zeros. If k is negative, I've got a bunch of zeros before the decimal point. So 3014, I'd write that as 3.141 times 10 to the 3. And the k would be 3, and that would be telling me how many zeros to pad. So this is just scientific notation. If I care about leading digits, what's so nice about this notation is it allows me to focus on what I really care about. What I really care about is the significant, the s of x part, the part that's between 1 and 10. I don't care so much about the integer k. All that tells me is, do I have a bunch of zeros after my number, or do I have a bunch of zeros before my leading digit occurs? All right, the next bit is two numbers, uh, x and x tilde, they have the same significance if and only if they have the same leading digits. And the reason is if two numbers have the same significance, they have to differ only by their choice of k. So what that means is they have either a different number of trailing digits of 0 or leading digits of 0. If I only care about the leading digits, I don't care about k. I just care about the significant part. This is giving me the machinery to investigate questions like this. Uh, for those of you who wonder why I'm hopping like this, it's trying to keep the talk in focus for the camera. OK. And then the key observation is if I take x and x tilde, and I look at their logarithms, and if I want to look at digits base 10, I'll take the logarithms base 10. I apologize to my colleagues in the math department for not working base e today. So I take the logs base 10, and if those are equal mod 1, then x and x tilde have the same leading digits. And conversely, if they have the same leading digits, then their logarithms are equal modulo 1. And the reason this is true is if I take the logarithm, I have the log of a product is the, is the sum of the logs. The log of 10 to the k is going to be k times the log of 10. It's going to give me just this extra integer boost. And because I'm taking a mod 1, that means throw away the integer part. So when you use elementary properties of logarithms, these two expressions are equal if and only if x and x tilde have the same leading digits. So why do we care so much about this? This allows us to use some machinery, especially machinery from Fourier analysis, to tackle problems like this. So we do a transformation on our data set. There is no way I will be able to convince most people that when you see a number, you should immediately take the logarithm base 10 and then throw away the integer part. But if you were to do that transformation, you would actually lose Benford's law. And it'll be very interesting what will emerge in place of Benford's law. So the transform we do is we look at the logarithm, we throw away the integer part, and we call that y. And the reason this is so nice is if I give you uh, the function e to the 2 pi i u, uh, this is your cosine 2 pi u plus i sine 2 pi u. Every time u increases by an integer, I return to where I started. These are periodic functions. And what's nice is I can replace u with u mod 1 in my input here. Normally, you can't just throw away the integer part of a number and evaluate it. If you think so, uh, take your next bank statement and just throw away the integer part of you know, your savings account or your checking account and see if you feel as good as you did when you first read it. Okay, maybe if it's your credit card company, you'd be happy with that. You can't normally just throw away integer parts of numbers without any harm being done. But these functions are very nice. I can throw away the integer parts without changing their value. And what this means is the tools of Fourier analysis are ideally suited to investigations in Benford's law. All right, so the key ingredient in a lot of the proofs is this notion of equidistribution. So we say a sequence of numbers is equidistributed modulo 1 if the fraction of the time it lands in the interval is the relative length of that interval. So let's say all of our numbers, the only possible values they take are between 0 and 1. Then what does it mean for my sequence to fall equidistributed in the interval, to fall uniformly in the interval? It means the fraction of the time I land in the subinterval a, b is just the length of the interval b minus a. So if I take the interval 1 third to 2 thirds, that covers 1 third of my interval, about a third of the time I should live in there. If I take the interval 0 to 1 fifth, that covers 1 fifth of my interval. If my sequence is equidistributed, I should land in there about 1 fifth of the time. So this is one of the key ingredients in trying to prove results about Benford's law. So just quantifying it, we're just counting the fraction of times we land in the interval a, b, and we say that as our count gets larger and larger and larger, if that converges to b minus a, it's equidistributed. 
So one of the big theorems, uh, Cesar and I will have you know, friendly arguments as to the best way to prove this using either ergodic theory or number theory. Uh, we can throw Leo into the mix now. Uh, is that if beta is an irrational number, then n times beta is equidistributed mod 1. So what this means is if I fix an irrational number beta, like square root of 2, and I look at square root of 2, 2 square root of 2, 3 square root of 2, 4 square root of 2, how much time do I have to fill up? <laughs> so if I just keep doing something like that and I look at the fractional parts, those will fall uniformly. All right, so I have to prove something. So I'm going to prove that the log of 2 base 10 is an irrational number. And since the log of 2 base 10 is an irrational number, that will then say if I look at uh, 1 times this, 2 times this, 3 times this, 4 times this, that will fall uniformly. That will be useful later on. For the Fibonacci numbers, you would want to prove that the log of the golden mean is irrational. And you know, if you get bored during the talk, you're welcome to try to do that. All right, so proof. Imagine that the log of 2 base 10 is rational. So I can write it as the ratio of two non-zero integers, p over q. I'll remove all common factors. So I can write 2 as 10 to the p over q. Well, I can raise both sides to the qth power, and I get 2 to the q is 10 to the p. Well, 10 is 2 times 5, so if I cancel, I get 2 to the q minus p is 5 to the p. So what's the only way I could have a power of 2, which is even being a power of 5, which is odd? The only way is if p and q minus p are both 0. Well, if they're both 0, I've got 2 is equal to 10 to the 0 over 0. That can't happen. That means you know, I've got 0 over 0. Not allowed to do this in public. So the log of 2 base 10 is irrational. All right. Uh, because I didn't want to risk using my laptop, I'm using the computers here, I didn't want to risk doing a mathematical simulation, I just chose one of my favorite irrational numbers. I chose square root of pi. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at n times the square root of pi, I'm looking at its fractional parts for the first 10 choices of n. And one of the reasons I like this number so much is this does look like it's equidistributed. It looks like it's falling evenly. It's not so good that I get something in each interval of length one-tenth, you know, zero to one-tenth, one-tenth to two-tenths. There's some fluctuations, so, you know, it's not entirely cooked up. But it looks roughly pretty good. And then square root of pi is an irrational number, so this big theorem I've said will tell me that these fractional parts become uniformly distributed, become equidistributed as I take more and more data points. So let's go up to 100, 1,000. If you have really good eyesight, 10,000, you can see very small fluctuations. Very quickly, this settles into equidistributed behavior. One of the big questions that the IRS has when they use stuff like this to detect tax fraud, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is how quickly does the behavior set in? And this is one of the things that I want to investigate further with my students. The IRS needs to know how many data points do we need before we can be reasonably certain that something fishy is going on. All right, so the fundamental equivalence is if I give you a data set, so I give you a set of values x1, x2, x3, x4. I'm going to let the y's be the transforms we talked about where we take the logarithms. It turns out your initial data set is Benford. It has this digit bias if and only if the transformed data set falls evenly in the interval 0, 1 when we look at just the fractional parts. And now hopefully this explains why I care so much about these equidistribution results and these equidistribution theorems. These give us a way to detect, to detect Benford's law. It also tells us that Benford's law of digit bias actually evaporates if you do this logarithmic transform of the data. Under this logarithmic transform of the data, your new behavior is uniform. Your new behavior is evenly distributed. All right, so why is this true? Well, I'm going to write my number as a significant times 10 to the k. I take the logarithm, and then using properties of the logarithm, I get the log of the significant plus an integer. Now I chop off the integer parts. I chop off the k. The significant is between 1 and 10, so its logarithm is between 0 and 1. And now I want to look and see what's the distribution of the significant, how does that affect the distribution of my original number. So here's a little plot. Um, I will try to get out of the way so you can see it. So I take the numbers 1 to 10 up top. I take the logarithms down below. Any number between 1 and 2, when I do this transformation to it, it's going to land between 0 and 0.3. And this is why you'll see about 30% of the numbers having a leading digit of 1. All the numbers between 2 and 3, when I do this, they're going to now lie in this interval over here. That will give me the probability of having a 2. So it turns out that things that fall evenly down here, when you transform them upwards, they become biased. So this covers 30% of the interval. I should be in here about 30% of the time. When I exponentiate upwards to my original data set, now I have a leading digit of 1. If you want to get the actual formula, 
what you do is you just say, okay, well, I've got what these numbers are, so I want to know what's the probability my leading digit is D. I want to go all the way up to D plus 1, subtract the probability up to D. That'll give me the probability of the difference. You use the log of a difference is the log of the quotient, and when the dust settles, you get the log of D plus 1 over D. So this gives you a sense of where the formula comes from, where these probabilities come from. Okay, so now let's do some examples. So the first example is 2 to the n is Benford base 10, because one of the results we proved earlier is the log of 2 base 10 is irrational. We then use that big result I mentioned that said if you have an irrational number, then if you look at the integer multiples of that, and if you look at the fractional parts that follows uniformly, well, anything that follows uniformly, when you exponentiate backwards, you get Benford. So this is going to give us 2 to the n is Benford. A little bit more interesting one is the Fibonacci numbers. So if you haven't seen uh, your proofs of the Fibonacci numbers, it has some of my favorite equations in mathematics. And you know, while I can resist the temptation to talk about them, it's hard to do so. So I want to just talk a little bit about the Fibonaccis. So they're given by the recurrence relation a n plus 1 is a n plus a n minus 1. Depending on what I'm talking about, I might have different initial conditions. I choose the first values maybe to be 0, 1 or 1, 2. And then once you know any two values, this relation just propagates and gives you all the remaining terms in the sequence. You just add the two previous terms to get the next one down the line. What I love is one of the ways to solve the Fibonacci's is to just plug through and just compute, 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 compute. It's also possible to bypass this and use what's called Binet's formula and just jump to the nth Fibonacci number without calculating all the previous terms. And the method of proof, or one of the methods of proof that I like the most, is the method of divine inspiration, where basically you write down the solution, and then you're done. Now, you know, when I teach, this is you know, a very difficult method to teach my students, and I have to worry about you know, which department am I teaching in to talk about divine inspiration. But the idea here is to guess maybe the solution is the form r to the n. This is not a bad guess. If I try to look at the recurrence relation to the Fibonacci's, I would get a n plus 1 is going to be less than or equal to twice a n, because my sequence is increasing. So if I replace a n minus 1 with a n, that should be larger. What that means is my sequence should be growing slower than 2 to the n. If I replace it with a n minus 1 plus a n minus 1, that should be a lower bound, and it gives me my Fibonacci number should be growing greater, growing faster than square root of 2 to the n. So I've got a sequence that's growing somewhere between root 2 to the n and 2 to the n. It's not unreasonable to say maybe there's some special growth rate r, and it's growing at the rate of r to the n. So we try a n is r to the n. We plug that in, and we get this formula for r. We then divide by r to the n minus 1, and we get r squared is r plus 1. This is a quadratic equation. The roots are 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2. You can see the golden mean. It turns out that since this is a linear difference equation, if you have a solution, you can multiply the solution by a scalar, and it's still a solution. So I could multiply, instead of looking at r to the n, I could look at 5 times r to the n, or 6 times r to the n. If I have two solutions and I add them, it's still a solution. So it turns out the general solution is of the following form, some number c1 and c2. And then you can figure out what those numbers are based on the initial values to the problem. And so when the dust settles, if you use the standard definition of the Fibonacci as 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, you get a n is 1 over root 5, 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n, minus 1 over root 5, 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. What I love about this is, you know, the Fibonacci numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. What kind of numbers are these? 13, 21, 18. they're integers. If you were given a police lineup and you were told, you know, <laughs> you know, identify the integer in the police lineup and, these were, and this was one of your candidates, you would pass. You've got divisions by two, you've got square roots of five. Everything cancels and it comes out to be an integer. Well, what's going on? If you look at the size of one plus root five over two, this is larger than one in absolute value. This is smaller than one in absolute value. If you take a very large value of n, this is very negligible down here. And essentially, your entire number is given by this. And so this is where the Benford's law is going to come from. This is going to be a negligible change that's not going to change that many digits. All right, and so you would then use that the log of the golden mean is irrational, and that's where the Benfordness would come from. So it turns out most linear recurrence relations are Benford. So as an example, here's another one. A n plus 1 is 2 times a n. This is the one we looked at earlier, just doubling the numbers, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Uh, if I change it a little bit, uh, I, I worked a little bit carefully, this one is not going to be 
Benford. And oops, this has some interesting properties. If I choose my first two terms to be 1, 2 minus 1 is 1. And I'll always be 1. Or equivalently, if I take the first one to be 0 and the next one to be 1, uh, 1 minus 0 is 2. Then 2 times 2 minus 1 is 3. Then 2 times 3 minus 2 is 4. So if I choose this as my initial conditions, I get the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I will get something that's not Benford. So there are a couple of situations for recurrence relations where you don't get Benford. But most of the time, you will get Benford's law. All right. So you know, 2 to the n is a nice one. You know, I think we all have a lot of experience with this. So I thought I would list uh, the first 60 values. The numbers get large kind of quickly. So I will instead only list the first 30. But I'll display the probabilities for the first 60. So I counted how many times I see a first digit of 1, how many times a first digit of 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's supposed to be Benford, so I listed the observed probabilities and the Benford probabilities. So what do you think? Good fit or not so good? Does it look Benford? All right, the general consensus is it seems Benford. Do any of the digits look particularly bad? Seven. Seven. Anything else? I think 9 is a little bit worse than 7, and so I'll highlight 9. And the solution as to what's going on is 2 to the 10th is almost 10 cubed. So I should really know if giga and mega are Greek or Latin. I apologize for always getting this confused. But when you talk about going from a megabyte to a gigabyte, according to the etymology of these words, you would think you're multiplying by 1,000. But the computer scientists, and I support you in this, you know, were very kind and decided not to have it multiplying by 1,000, but by multiplying by 1,024, by a perfect power of 2. Well, if we multiplied by 1,000 exactly, then every time we increase by you know, 10 in our sequence, we return to where we started, but padded with three zeros. That extra 24 out of 1,000, however, means we're going to be moving around and around and around. And that's what's going to lead to Benford's Law. If you look at these numbers, it's not a coincidence they're stacked like this. You know, each one here is 10 times the previous. And it takes a long time before any of these numbers have a different leading digit than what happened 10 ago. OK. Um, so what I then did is I chose three special numbers you know, near and dear to mathematicians, especially number theorists. I chose gamma, I chose e, and I chose pi. And I looked at the chi-squared statistic that just compared how good of a fit did Benford's Law do for the observed data. And I looked at values of n from you know, 100 to 1,000. The smaller the chi-squared statistic, the better the fit. The larger the statistic, the worse the fit. For the most part, the fits look pretty good. You, know, you would expect from statistics, I don't see any statisticians here today, so I don't have to be too careful. You would expect about 5% you know, of the time, if it was really given by Benford's law, you would get a value of 15.5 a lot. And so you see, for the most part, everything is pretty good. Which is the one number that's bad? Pi. OK, who are my math undergrad geeks here? You're on the spot now. All right, how, how many digits of pi can you give me? Um, 20. 20. Pi squared. Oh, kids these days. Well, sadly, you need to do more than just pi squared. You need to get up to pi to the 175. And if you look at pi to the 175, pi to the 175 is about 1.0028 times 10 to the 87. So every time you go through 87, I'm sorry, through 175 multiples of pi, or maybe it's 174, I always get this wrong, you've basically padded your number by 87 zeros. Not quite, and this is the same thing that happened with 2 to the n. And that slight little difference is what's going to lead to Benford's law. But it means it's going to be some issues with the convergence. And what we expect and what we see is we see some kind of cyclic behavior in how good powers of pi are to Benford's law. And so in the interest of you know, graphing it, I'm plotting not the chi-squared values, but the log of the chi-squared values. And you can see roughly, yeah, it does look like about 175 you know, between each thing. And the size of the peak seems to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So again, one of the things the IRS is really concerned with is how quickly this behavior sets in. So the picture is a plot of the log of the chi-squared values for powers of a certain number to Benford's law. How good of a fit is Benford's law? So the red is how good of a fit Benford is to powers of pi. 
the blue is how good of a fit it is to powers of, I think, E. And you can see a fundamentally different nature between E and pi. And a lot of it comes down to how well can we approximate these numbers or the logarithms of these numbers by rationals. All right. So why Benford's law? So why is Benford's law occurring in so many different places? So not all data sets satisfy Benford's law. So imagine you have a long street, and the streets will be, the houses will be labeled from 1 to L. And then you can ask, well, what fraction of the time do you have a street with you know, a house on that street with a first digit of 1, of 2, of 3? Well, depending on where you cut off the length of the street, you're going to get very different answers. And it's going to oscillate between 1 ninth and 5 ninths. And so here's a very hard plot that I made in Mathematica to show what's going on. I'm looking at the probability of a first digit of 1 as a function of the street length. And as my street length gets larger, you know, I can see it starts getting smaller. Well, that makes sense. If I stop at a street of length 100, and now I go a little bit higher, all the houses I'm going to be getting will be having a lot of 1s until I get to 200. So I expect the probability to increase for a little bit. And now once I get to 200, the probability is going to be decreasing until I get to 1,000. And it's going to be oscillating like this. Well, we've already seen how useful the logarithm is before. The logarithm is very useful in trying to make uh, sense of this data. And if I do a logarithmic transform and now plot what's going on on a log scale, so I'm plotting the probability of the first digit as a function of the log of the street length, you can now see it's every time I increase by an order of magnitude, I essentially get back to where I was before. This is what happens if I have a street of a fixed length. Okay. What if I have many streets of many different lengths? So again, um, I'm going to assume right now I have 100 streets, and I'm going to choose all of their lengths from 1 to uh, 10,000. And so I'm going to look at the first two digits versus Benford's law. So in this case, I'm going to assume all the streets have the same length. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to choose the length of the streets randomly. And so I'm going to allow my streets to have different lengths. This seems to be a much more reasonable model for what you would find in the real world, where not all streets have the same number of houses. And when I do that, you can see the fit is becoming much closer to Benford's law. And this is a general phenomenon. The more iterations you have of processes, the closer the behavior is going to be to Benford's law. The more mixing you have going on, the more Benford it is. Why is it really Benford? What's really going on, and I'll talk about it in a moment, is the central limit theorem is lurking in the background. And this is one of the big convergence results that a lot of different processes tend to become normally distributed. And that is going to be related to Benford's law here. We could go one level further. And now I'm choosing 100 streets. And each street, I randomly choose a number between 1 and 10,000. Uh, 10, and then I randomly choose a number between 1 and that randomly chosen number to be the length of my street. And this you know, two-step process now is a much better fit to Benford. And I proved with a couple of students you know, several years ago that if you just iterate this even more, it will very quickly converge to Benford's law. And we have really good rates of convergence, really good estimates of how long you have to wait. All right, so I'm going to risk you know, trying to give you a, a detailed nuts and bolts sense of why the Benford's is kicking in, why so many different systems satisfy Benford's law. So I want to go a little bit into the probability. And then after that, I'll go into the applications of why the IRS cares about this. So to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, here's a plot of a probability distribution. Something's a probability distribution if it's non-negative, if the area under the curve is 1, and then the probability I take on a certain value is just the area under the curve. So if I want to know what's the probability x takes on a value between a and b, I just integrate under the curve from a to b. Uh, two of the big concepts we use is the mean or the average value. I just integrate x times my density. The next is the variance, how spread out things are. And you know, the larger the variance, the more spread out it is. And then the last is the notion of independence. So we say two events are independent if knowledge of one event gives you no information about knowledge of another. All right, so one of the most important distributions uh, is the normal distribution, the bell curve, the Gaussian. Anything with this many names must be important. It's given by e to the negative x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared divided by some kind of normalization constant. And so the big theorem, the central limit theorem, is if you have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables, and then it's fun to see exactly how far you can weaken this, if you look at their sum, divide by the mean of that sum, and then normalize it, this new resulting quantity is going to become normally distributed. And so this is why in certain of my classes, 
you know, when I'm trying to decide upon grading policies, I know ahead of time my classes are large enough that the central limit theorem will be kicking in for how things are distributed. All right. So just as a little example, I'm choosing uh, some values from a uniform random variable, you know, uniformly distributed, and I'm comparing it, so I'm going to renormalize it and compare it to a Gaussian. So the first case here is I'm just choosing a number uniformly. I'm just changing the standard deviation now so that I'm comparing apples to apples. And if the blue is what I get is my probability density for choosing one uniform random variable. And I'm comparing it to the gold standard, the Gaussian. <coughs> now I compare the sum of two uniform random variables. Think of it as rolling a die. And so if you roll you know, one die, you get one, two, three, four, five, six. All of them are equally likely if you're not cheating. If you roll two die, you now get numbers between 2 and 12. What's the most common number you roll? 7. And you get that 1 sixth of the time. And then the probabilities decrease all the way down to you get 2, uh, 1 36th of the time, and 12, 1 36th of the time. And there's your triangle. You can now do it sum of four uniform random variables. And you get the blue curve. You can do the sum of eight. And if you have good eyesight, you can see a slight difference between this and what's going on. Uh, here is an explicit formula if you want for the density of the sum of four uniform random variables. Mathematica was able to calculate this without too much trouble. Uh, Mathematica refused to go further. But you, know, you can write all this down explicitly. You don't want to. The whole point is to avoid having to do calculations like this and replace it with approximations. You, know, you want to say, it's approximately normally distributed. I can work with the normal distribution. This is a well-tabulated distribution, and I can gain things from that. All right. Now let's look at the normal distribution modulo 1. What does this mean? Well, I have some random variable. So this is the same as imagining that you know, Williams has decided to fight grade inflation by giving people extremely accurate grades where we will grade everybody's exams to 12 decimal places. And then after we do this, we're going to do the ridiculous experiment of chopping off their integer. Okay? And so we're only going to look at the fractional part of the student grades. For those of you who are in my class, do not worry. I do not plan on implementing this policy this semester, not till next year. So if we do that, we can ask, well, what is the resulting distribution? Well, because we're throwing away the integer parts, the only possible values we have are between 0 and 1. If you want, think of it as we take the uniform, I'm sorry, we take the normal distribution, we take the bell curve, and we keep folding it back on itself. So every time we go past another integer, we fold back and we just keep putting the probabilities and we pile them all up and we want to see how is it distributed. So if I take a normal distribution where the variance is 0 0.01, this is the distribution I get for how likely is it to have a number between you know, 0 and 0.2, very likely, between 0.4 and 0.6, turns out to be very unlikely. If I increase the variance to 0.1, you see that if I now look at the normal distribution modulo 1, there's not that much fluctuation. If I increase the variance to 0.5, well, it might look like there's a lot of fluctuation until you look at the left-hand column and you see what the units are on the y-axis, going from 0.99990 to 1.00010. And you see that there's almost no fluctuation at all, that it is essentially uniformly distributed. So when I look at a Gaussian, as the variance of the Gaussian grows, and this is going to be important, it looks like all numbers are equally likely. All right, so why is this useful? So I tell all of my students, whenever you see a product, you should have a Pavlovian response. You should want to take a logarithm. Because we know how to do sums. We don't know how to do products. So imagine I have a bunch of variables, x1, x2, x3. They're nice. This is a technical term. I'll let wn be their product. I'm going to take the logarithm. So I'm going to let yi be the log of xi, I'll let vn be the log of wn. So now, vn is the log of the xi's, the log of a product is the sum of the logarithms. Well, the log of xi is just yi, oops, went too fast, and so now I have vn as the sum of random variables. And these variables are independent. So the central limit theorem says that this sum should become normally distributed. Well, if it's normally distributed, I really care about what's going on modulo 1. I care about the fractional part. And then I get Benford's law if the fractional part is uniformly distributed when I exponentiate. And when I exponentiate Vn, I get back to my original product. And so the central limit theorem tells me that this sum becomes normally distributed with a growing variance. And something that's normally distributed with a growing variance becomes uniform modulo 1. And this is one of the reasons why Benford's law occurs in so many different places. Because what's really going on is the central limit theorem, one of the big results in probability, that's what's lurking. 
And it's really, I have a very complicated process. If you want to figure out, I've got a gold brick, and I wish I had one, you know, you've got length, width, height, density, price of gold per ounce, and all these different things are coming in multiplicatively to tell you how much that's worth. So as you have a lot of different variables going on and being chosen, the value of the final thing is going to be a function of all this different stuff. So you know, hopefully this gives you some sense of where Benford is coming from. For the difference equations, it's coming from the fact that we have this geometric growth. For a lot of other things, when you have a lot of complicated things all interacting together, it's this multiplicative nature. OK, so applications. So uh, this is a tale of two Steve Millers. Does anybody know who this is? All right, who's this guy? Steve yes, exactly, right? It's a tale of two Steve Millers. This is the Steve Miller who got into trouble. Uh, this is the Steve Miller who worked at the IRS. And so you may remember the IRS was targeting certain organizations. And they were targeting organizations not because of potential fraud, but because of political beliefs. So this is how you should target people mathematically. So if you get nothing else from my talk, uh, he got into trouble for using incorrect reasons. All right, this is from a colleague of mine. Uh, it's deliberately blurry over here. If you go to the slides, you can get a better view. It's from somebody named William J. who was married to someone named Hillary. They had one daughter. It said, it's amazing what the Freedom of Information Act will get you. And so you can look at tax returns of individuals. This is one of the big applications of Benford's Law. All right, so one of my favorite examples is an audit of a bank revealed a huge spike of numbers starting with first digit Right, but we expected that because of Benford's Law. So we mod out by Benford's Law and we see which number is occurring more frequently than you would expect according to Benford's Law. Any thoughts? Seven. Nope. Nine. Nope. Not many left. I've got how many minutes do I have left? Uh, four. Uh, four. Okay, four. Yes, four. Yes. Huge spike of numbers starting with four. It's <laughs> trying to time this perfectly. And, what was the, and then they investigated a little bit further. There was a spike with fours, and they looked at the second digit. Any thoughts as to what the second digits were? There was a huge spike of four. Random guess. Four eights and four nines. And it was, turns out it was mostly due to one person. Has anybody ever had a credit card lost or stolen? What do you do when that happens? Call the, Call the bank up. And so what was going on is a person had their friends taking out credit cards from the bank and running up debts of about $4,800, $4,900. And then they called up the credit card company. And they kept doing it until they got their friend to pick up the phone. Oh, your card was stolen. Oh, that's so sad. Don't worry. You're not liable for any of the charges. And so they would do it. Uh, mostly about $4,800, $4,900. The bank, the credit card, had an internal limit of $5,000. It wasn't worth their time to investigate you know, a stolen credit card with $15 in charges or $30 in charges. It's going to cost the agent far more than that to investigate. $65,000 in stolen charges that you investigate. So there should be a line of demarcation, investigate or don't investigate. And the mistake a lot of the banks were making was they had a fixed line. Anything below 5,000, there must be an internal investigation. Anything below 5,000, the person can just write off. What you should really do is you should say, we investigate everything above 60,000, and then we randomly investigate some subset of things below 60,000, going all the way down, and occasionally you will investigate somebody who calls up with a stolen credit card of $15. This is how grandma gets checked now at security lines with TSA. And you need to do some things like this. And so there was a huge issue with you know, just one person, they were able to catch him by using Benford's Law. Uh, another one is, this is a plot of looking at stream flow data. One of the nice things about looking at stream flow data is we have data going back over 100 years. The technology hasn't changed that much in all the time. And we can get very massive data sets. And you can see an excellent fit of the leading two digits with uh, Benford. So another one is election fraud. You know, around in 2009, uh, there's been a lot of analysis done as to whether or not there was you know, fraud occurring. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here other than to just say that this is another very popular area where people use Benford's Law. For a lot of this, though, they don't look at the first digit. They actually look at the last digits. 
know, when people are randomly making up numbers, people sometimes have trouble making numbers that look truly random. They may not have the last two digits being equal nearly enough of the time. Yes, well, um, I have one and a half minutes. Should be like one. Okay. So very quickly, the Riemann zeta function and Benford's law. So why, should, why does number theory come into play? So the Riemann zeta function is defined as the sum of 1 over n to the s, where n ranges over the positive integers. It turns out it's also a product over primes. And so uh, there's lots of ways to prove this. You can use the geometric series formula. You can use unique factorization, uh, expand everything out. And so there's lots of different connections. Uh, you know, too much to go into in 55 seconds. But I'll just say that a lot of the properties of the Riemann zeta function are related to primes. Primes are the basic building blocks in number theory. So if you want to count how many primes there are, it turns out there's lots of different proofs of using the Riemann zeta function to prove that the number of primes go to infinity and to start talking about properties between them. So what I wanted to just end on my final slide is I'm going to look at the Riemann zeta function. I'm going to evaluate it on the critical line, which is where all the action happens. And I'm going to evaluate it at 65,000 roughly points. And I'm going to plot the values of the Riemann zeta function. And I'm going to look at that, and I'm going to compare it to Benford's law. And what you'll notice is an incredible fit. I don't remember if the star or the diamond is Benford's law and the Riemann zeta function. One is one, one is the other. I don't remember which. But the point of this is that Benford's law occurs in a variety of places. And so depending on your perspective, you can either use the Riemann zeta function to detect tax fraud, or if you're otherwise inclined, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. I still have I still have friends. No, not at all. Yes. So is the IRS just looking at all the digits in our tax reform, like 10 or they have No, because fortunately for individuals, there's not enough data on your form for them to detect whether or not you're cheating on your tax. What they can do is they can detect whether or not the American public as a whole is cheating. So they can look at distribution, say, of charitable dedu uh, deductions. And they can be very confident that as a whole, cheating is occurring. But whether or not an individual is cheating, that they are not able to detect. Uh, in terms of corporations, corporations have a lot more data that's being inputted into their forms. And there's enough data that the IRS is confident in certain cases. So you know, again, whether or not it's good or bad, the IRS has a finite amount of resources. And they have to decide how they want to allocate them, which companies should they investigate, which are the uh, cases where A, fraud is happening, and B, we believe we can prove the fraud is happening in a court of law. And so Benefit's Law becomes a really good triage that the IRS can use. Uh, I can't mention names now, but I do know accountants who actually run Benefit's Law tests on data before they file. And if the numbers are out of line with Benefit's Law, they actually ask their clients if they are sure that they gave them all the correct figures and if they might want to rethink. Uh, one just other thing to say when you're looking at tax returns or you know, corporate data, you've got to be very careful to look at pure numbers and not derived numbers. So for those of you who will be having the fun of actually filling out your taxes in the near future, you have so many uh, quantities that are computed in terms of previous ones. Well, we saw earlier that the more times you do mathematical operations to a data set, the more averaging goes on, and on a logarithmic scale, the more uniformly things typically become. And in that case, you actually then get Benford's Law. So you want to just do the analysis to the pure numbers. And that's why the individuals are, for the most part, safe. We don't have enough pure numbers on our taxes. That's one of the places where Benford's Law comes out of. There's other places where Benford's Law can come out of. One of the easiest ways to show where it occurs is through this multiplicative process. Well, a lot of the stuff you could almost view, uh, you know, in a good year, maybe the stock market goes up a certain amount. And so maybe you have a lot of different quantities in your corporation that have a certain growth rate per year. And these geometric processes will be Benford. And then oftentimes, if you have a bunch of things that are Benford and you amalgamate them, they become Benford as well. 
So a lot of the individual processes, there is this kind of multiplicative or geometric structure to it. And in fact, in Frank Benford's original paper, I believe one of the sections was titled something along the lines of you know, the geometric ratio aspect of what was going on. But there are other ways to get Benford's law other than multiplication. Right. And just yes. Of the you on your second slide, the number of Twitter followers. Yes. Right, and it, it, it doesn't have to be a multiplicative structure there. Uh, the, the main thing is if you have a distribution which is nice and covers many orders of magnitude, and nice, you've got to be very careful about this, then when you look at it logarithmically, it's going to look hopefully uniformly distributed, and that uniform distribution on a logarithmic scale, you know, things averaging out, will then give you benefitness. You've got to be very careful because you do not always have things nice on orders of magnitude. Uh, Williamstown temperatures, I do not think will be Benford distributed, unless you include maybe the negatives. So, so you alluded uh, at the very beginning uh, to the fact that you take advantage of this to compress information because you, if you already know there's a higher probability of certain conditions. Right. Um, so things like arithmetic and trivia. But uh, so then I sort of follow that chain of thought, but then you also pointed out that uh, you know when you're in some, you know, zeros kind of don't count. Right. But so if you're in, in, in base two, Yes. So in the art of programming, they talk about this as to where do you want to put the decimal point? Do you want to write the numbers as 0.1 or as one point in terms of trying to minimize the number of operations? But the other thing is, you know, Benford's law can be more than just the first digit. You can also talk about first two digits, first k digits, and something like that. And so I, I do agree that you know, this is not a appropriate venue to talk about the leading digit space two. <laughs> Are there any other questions before I answer this one? <laughs> All right, I'm going to just hit stop now before I answer that one.